what I'd like to do today is briefly talk a bit about my own story, where, where I came from and how it fed my career uh, and my philanthropy. And I can really sum up the main themes here in, in two questions. One is, how does an outsider become successful? And second, what does a successful outsider do with that success? So let's travel back. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> this would be fifth or sixth grade. That was me. My sister is sitting here. She just startled. Hasn't, hasn't, hasn't seen this in a while. Um, I actually began as a double outsider. First, we Jews are and have been a marginalized people. In Eastern Europe, which is where my family came from, we were, of course, restricted where we could live and where we could work. We were targets of persecution and violence, and that was the impetus for many of our families, including my own, to come to America. You don't get much more outside than that. And interestingly, America as the land of opportunity, which it is, we shouldn't forget that Jews were also outsiders here. I recently learned that um, as recently as just a couple of years before I went to Yale as an undergraduate, which was in 1967, so when I graduated from high school, up through 1965, Yale still had a Jewish quota. It was the last of the Ivy League schools to uh, uh, drop uh, the Jewish quota. But in addition to my Jewish background, my personal experience in life growing up was shaped by being a target of bullying in uh, my schools. Not helped by the fact that while I was academically advanced and so skipped second grade, I was thus a couple of years younger than everyone else with uh, average social skills. And in that time, in that place, bullying was not uh, at all uncommon. And I, it really put me on the outside of the outside in my school system growing up, the Freeport Public Schools on, on Long Island. And I was reflecting on this lately because there was a news story about one of the presidential candidates who shall go unnamed uh, back in high school. And it was reported that he led a, a pack of kids who chased down and tackled a kid who was different um, uh, and cut off his dyed blonde hair. Uh, and when that came to light, there was a wonderful op-ed by Charles Blow in the New York Times that I cannot improve on because it so spoke articulately for my own experience as being a target, which is that if that incident happened, as described, it wasn't a prank, it wasn't even bullying, it was an assault. To chuckle about it in the present day is insensitive. And not to remember having committed that is almost unimaginable. And an apology based on if I hurt someone misses the point that it is a horrible thing to do regardless of the impact. And today, it was a terrible lost opportunity for a teachable moment about bullying and a very poor example of how to address a mistake made. The sage Hillel said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. And that kind of sums up that incident. And I can tell you my outsiderness was shaped by my family's tradition and heritage and the particular things that happened to me. I took refuge in numbers. I'm a kind of a mathematical sort of guy. I have a lot of talent there. And I managed to create a safe space away from a lot of the social interaction by 
learning to be good at math and solving problems and being on the math team and, and building my identity around that. And then the 1960s came and I wandered. So <laughs> I had opportunities that came from growing up in the middle class. There's some privilege there. There was economic security. I grew up in the culture of the 60s. I was at Woodstock. I was a disc jockey in college. Uh, spent my time at the Yale radio station and then did that professionally. And then finally, I became a meditation teacher of transcendental meditation. So I was one of those lost, lost souls through the 60s and, uh, uh, and 70s. And that um, changed. And it changed when the personal computer came out. There was something about the PC. It was just waiting for me. It was a kind of a romance. And back when it was still a hobbyist sort of thing in the 1970s, long before there were any PCs used in, in business, I developed the conviction that everybody was going to have a personal computer, that they were going to become indispensable tools of personal empowerment. And this was a completely crazy idea. Nobody else believed it at the time, but I just felt it and my perspective sitting perched on the edge of things looking to what was coming next gave me some advantage. And I was fortunate to be able to start a company and that was Lotus Development and create an application that was Lotus 123. It was the killer app, as they say, that brought the desktop computer to the business world in the 1980s. And we grew the company. It was, it was a small version of today's Googles and Facebooks. We grew to hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of employees in literally a couple of years. And that was a huge and totally unexpected professional accomplishment uh, on my part. So here we are in the Lotus position again some 30 years later. Uh, my unlikely path led to some very remarkable recognition this is the Entrepreneur's Walk of Fame, uh, which was just uh, unveiled in Kendall Square, Cambridge, right near Lotus uh, uh, last, uh, last fall. I was in some very distinguished company of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, who were honored, and Hewlett and Packard, and a couple of others. And there's a quote, uh, which uh, is uh, Frida and I authored together that's on the sidewalk there. It's right next to the tea stop near the Kendall Square Hotel. Uh, and the quote I want to read to you is, building a workplace which engages a diversity of employees and brings out their best makes a far greater contribution than financial success alone. And that is what I am proud of at Lotus and what I want people to remember. It was the culture that we made, its impact on the thousands of employees who were there, our efforts not just to talk the talk about practicing good values, but judging ourselves by how well we walked the walk. One thing we did actually is we literally tied a portion of managers' bonuses to how well their reports evaluated them putting the corporate values into actual practice. That's walking the walk. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that we did, some of which uh, Neil uh, uh, thoughtfully talked about in the introduction, so I won't get over, I won't go over again in terms of building a diverse culture and really standing up as a good corporate citizen. Well, a lot happened. It's been a lot of years since Lotus, which was in the early and mid-1980s. And in 1999, Frida and I moved here to the Bay Area. And one of the things that happened when we came here is that Frida, who is a graduate of UC Berkeley, uh, was appointed to the advisory board at the College of Letters and Science there. And in that context, heard about what had happened to the enrollments of uh, students of color since Prop 209, which banned affirmative action. And the uh, diversity uh, completely plummeted and she was moved with some of her colleagues to begin a scholarship program to uh, help address that, a private scholarship program, since state funds can't be used, uh, to help support once admitted uh, students of color at, from low-income 
communities at, uh, at Berkeley to help them succeed, to graduate, and to go on. Uh, and I became a supporter of that, uh, an ardent supporter. One interesting statistic there, Pell Grants, which go to students from low-income communities. There are more Pell Grant students at UC Berkeley than at the entire Ivy League and Stanford combined. It really is a gateway school. And we have supported uh, many, many uh, uh, graduates from UC Berkeley. I was just at the uh, graduation of the Ideal Scholars, Ideal is Initiative for uh, Diversity in Education and Leadership, the name of the program. Many of them have gone on to law school, to medical school. One of our students is graduating from Harvard uh, Medical School this week. It's, it's, it's uh, quite, quite moving. I have a very personal connection to these students through my family. Let me explain. This is a picture of my father when he was, I think, about 1939, sometime late high school, early college. Um, he grew up very poor in the Depression in Queens, New York. Uh, his father, my grandfather, was a house painter, uh, unemployed for a very long time. Uh, period of time, and my father was not expecting to go to college at all. It was just not in the picture. He was, in fact, the first to go, and he went to City College of New York, CCNY, because it was free. It was a public university. It was the University of California system of its day. It was the gateway school, and it had a mission as a public institution to lift up students who were first in family to go to college. And he became, uh, he got an engineering degree. And he went on to serve his country in World War II in the Navy. He became a, a, a business person. I am the beneficiary of all of this. I wouldn't be here if he hadn't done what he had done. And he could not have done that if there wasn't a strong and vibrant public education system. And so all I am doing is practicing an ethic of reciprocity, of doing unto others as I'd have them do unto me in supporting these uh, students at UC Berkeley. But I want to tell you that my commitment, it's more personal and it goes deeper than this. And I want to dive into that by going back in time again. So seated, that is me uh, at age 15. Um, and I am uh, at a program called SSP, the Summer Science Program, which was in, first time I ever came to California. I grew up on Long Island. This was an astronomy program in Southern California. The US was trying to catch up to the Russians who had launched Sputnik and there was a missile gap and there was funding for programs to take kids with high potential in math and science. And I should say back in 66, kids meant boys, not girls. Uh, and I was in a six-week program that changed my life. I had hands-on exposure to computers for the first time. And the thing in the back on the right is not an oil burner. <laughs> it's a first-generation 1950s vintage uh, computer, uh, 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 a Bendix G15. And that was the first computer that I actually uh, programmed. I'm, I'm sitting at, 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 at the keyboard, which is a a typewriter keyboard. Six weeks changed my life, set me on the path that I went on in life. Fast forward, this is a young woman named Nico. This is, she is also seated at a keyboard. It's some 30 plus years later. She is getting hands-on exposure to computers in a summer program that focuses on developing students to go into the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it is at a program called SMASH, the Summer Math and Science Honors Academy, co-founded by my wife, Frida, that um, has become very centrally important to us in our lives. This is my one text slide. I said, it's a breakfast talk. I have some slides, but they're going to be pictures because it's breakfast. But this is important enough to make a little exception. So SMASH is a three-year summer program 
uh, for low-income high school students of color. It takes place on college campuses. Uh, half the students are girls. It's, it's hands-on, it's inquiry-based, and we have a nine-year track record. We started at UC Berkeley. We expanded to Stanford last summer. This summer will also be at UCLA and USC. Next summer, the mayor's office in Chicago has given us funding and we'll have pro a program or two uh, in Chicago and, and onward uh, from there. And if you want more information, the last line has the URL on it. But here's, here's the point that I want to make. Look at these two side by side. Me, 1966, Nico, 2009. These kids are not any different than I am. That was my conclusion. If, if you look beyond all the many differences on the surface of age, gender, class, race, it's all about talent that comes in unlikely and outsider packages. These smash kids want the same thing that I wanted, a chance to be accepted for who they are and a chance to make the most of their lives to develop and to contribute. And that's where my connection comes from. And we've learned some things about how you can help. You have to put kids in a setting with their peers. So for the first time, they'll be rewarded for who they are and not punished as outsiders for being, for being different. You have to challenge them by setting very high expectations. And you have to give them the support they need to succeed. And if you do that, they will. They will defy any intuition or expectation that kids who look like that can't succeed. And our graduates from our SMASH program are in college and beyond at Berkeley, Stanford. When they come to us at age 14 after ninth grade, many of them have never heard of MIT, and three years later, they're going to MIT. This is pretty rewarding, let me tell you, as well as doing some good in the world. So now, let me talk about the other side of my life, because that's the nonprofit support education, the business side. This is a young woman named Pooja Sankar. We, we hope Miko will grow up to be a Pooja. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, we invest at Cape War Capital in tech startups that are trying to make the world a better place, having positive social impact. And Pooja has a, an interesting story. Grew up in America, family moved to India, came back here. So she was going to IIT, not the Illinois Institute of Technology, the India Institute of Technology, super selective, hyper competitive, computer science as an undergraduate. And the exclusion she felt there, because there are almost no women in that program, was almost total. And it was very scarring. And when she came back and after she went to uh, graduate school in, uh, in business at Stanford, she started a company called Piazza. And if you have kids that are in the STEM fields, uh, they are probably using Piazza because it is spreading like wildfire across college campuses as an online study group discussion forum for technical classes. And the core of the design is to create something so that everybody feels included and nobody is excluded and everybody has a place and it's a welcoming place to ask and answer questions and to be part of a group. Entrepreneurs had said scratch their own itches. Entrepreneurs who come from a different kind of background are likely to have a different set of itches and they're likely to be innovative in unexpected and unusual kind of ways, and those are the kind of folks that we want to work with. One other entrepreneur. This is Gene Wade. Uh, Gene is the founder of a company called University Now. His life journey started in the housing projects in Roxbury in the Boston area and took him through Harvard Law School and an MBA at Wharton. He's a serial education entrepreneur. University now is addressing an enormous problem, which is the college affordability problem. I think we've seen the headlines recently. 
There's a trillion dollars of student debt, something like at least two-thirds of all students, might even be three-quarters, are graduating with significant debt. And for many students who, whose first path in college would be to go to community college, they can't get in, they can't get the classes they want because community colleges have been defunded, particularly uh, in California. University now develops programs, online programs, accredited uh, degree programs that are uh, oriented to, that, that use a competency-based learning model, which means go at your own pace. But the important thing is, and the disruptive innovation is $200 a month. You could get a BA for well less than $10,000, and in fact, if you're a working adult, the lifelong learning credit effectively makes it free. This is a for-profit business. It incorporates this great technology stack done by some Silicon Valley, uh, a, a, a crack team, and it is just, just launching, just rolling out. You'll see things for New Charter University, which this company operates, and there are more You'll see a, a big story coming out very soon in the Wall Street Journal. We love this kind of thing. We love to find and support entrepreneurs that have solid business ideas whose very success is going to create not just economic value, but social value as well. I have two more topics I want to touch on briefly, and then I think I'll be on time and can even take a couple of questions. Let me reflect a little bit about business ethics and Judaism. We celebrate the winners in business, but we often don't think enough about the price of winning. I have always been troubled, personally, by business as usual. I've never been comfortable with treating people as badly as you want and getting away with whatever you can, despite the wonderful products that that often creates. And I've never been comfortable with the end justifying the means. And these guys, whom I've uh, known and knew for many decades, all understand that's where I come from. And I think I get some respect from them for that. So we try to share this approach with the companies that we work with. The interesting thing was when I very recently started belatedly to do some readings in Judaism, I discovered that I had somehow absorbed Jewish business ethics without knowing it. I guarantee I didn't learn them in Hebrew school. And if they hadn't chained us to our seats there, I wouldn't have stayed in the class. But in reading, when I came across sayings like, let your fellow's money be as precious to you as your own, which comes from the pure care vote. I said, that's my philosophy. That is what I believe in, and implies a whole set of treating the person on the other side of the transaction, a sale, a negotiation, an investment, with the same respect and dignity that you would want to be treated with. And it's just fundamental, and I must have absorbed it osmotically. It did not happen by accident. And I have to credit the Jewish tradition and what I didn't know that I was learning for making me who I am. And finally, so this is an image that I took of the old city in uh, Jerusalem. It is similar to, though not identical, to the view out my balcony of the King David Hotel, which was a singular moment for me. And this was just a year ago. I had put off going to Israel approximately forever, had done a lot of international travel. I just didn't want to deal with all of the contradictions. I did not want to have to deal with my extreme discomfort at both the religious practices and the policies of many uh, uh, in the state of Israel. But Fried and I had a close friend who moved from New York to Jerusalem. We ran out of excuses. She made it very easy. She set up the whole trip. 
And I got there and stepped out onto the balcony, looked out at the old city in Mount Scopus and so on, and I just burst into tears. I was overcome by a feeling of profound connection to place and people. A very unexpected kind of coming home. I mean, very unexpected. And I realized I could no longer turn my back on my people, even those whose views and practices I do not like and oppose very, very strongly. We had a great visit, met lots of, lots of people. I was very impressed with the peace activists on both sides and with the entrepreneurs and investors who are attempting to create more economic interdependence. Went to the West Bank, spent a day in Ramallah, understand that there is a huge potential to do more than we've done, to lift up a people, to build economic ties, and to begin to make uh, a difference in that way. And I'm reminded of another saying from Pirkei Avot that I was unaware of until extremely recently. It is not your obligation to complete the task, but neither are you at liberty to desist from it entirely. And that is my feeling about what we are here to do in our lives, in business and in philanthropy. We cannot stand aside. We must engage. We may not get over the finish line, but we are here to do what we can do while we are here. Thank you so much.